All right, Sky Squad, we are back for a little mini rant slash recap. All right, I'm going to be saving the majority of my thoughts on this episode of the Real Housewives of Potomac Season 8 Reunion Part 2 for the Kimpire. Yes, I will be with Kimpire at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time today live and we are going to break down this good old episode i'm super excited he has quickly become one of my new favorite people um just uh i could go on and on about the spirit that this man possesses i just uh i just ah uh, i just uh, he's just awesome to me but before we get there i just there, there's some stuff that i just wanted to kind of get off my chest a little bit before I go over there, I want to, you know, give it to you guys here. And when I get over there, I'm going I'm to I'm show some uh, a bit more decorum. But here, I just needed to vent a couple of little things to you guys about last night's reunion. Now, if you didn't see it, I'm going to let you know it was a good reunion. Good in the sense that I felt like several things became a lot more apparent to me than they normally would have. But the episode was also triggering for me in a lot of different ways. And I just have, I got to say this. I don't know how many of you guys and y'all, and some of y'all are not going to like when I say this and that's okay. And that's fine. I'm trying to stick to mostly referring to people's actions versus characterizing who like you know name calling or anything like that but have y'all ever seen transformers if you have not let me just give you a brief rundown transformers was basically a battle of the uh autobots and the decepticons autobots were generally you know the good guys and they were typically you know they could transform into cars and then you had the Decepticons that could really deceive you by turning into, you know, everyday items, tape recorders, like boom boxes, you know, uh, weapons and that sort of thing like that. And there was a leader of the Decepticons named Megatron, right? But in the cartoon, well, in the, in the history, there was also this character called Galvatron. And Galvatron was Megatron in its most like menacing form. To me, this episode displayed Giselle in my mind as Galvatron, which was we have seen Megatron in its usually poised, um, stoic states at reunions. But I felt like in this reunion, we saw Giselle develop into her final form as Galvatron. Okay. I felt like Giselle just said, you know what? I'm going to embrace my villain era and I am just going to love every minute of it. And do you know why? I feel like the reason why is because ain't nobody going to do nothing about it. So I can say and do what I want. That's how it felt to me, okay? Now, y'all can say, oh, you don't like Giselle. You don't like Giselle. It ain't about who she is as a person for me. It is about her actions, okay? It is really about her actions. And if this reunion proved anything to me, it is that Giselle is unwilling to move forward with these girls. I'm going to give you several cases in point, right? But also, this rhetoric that it seems as though Wendy and Candace are solely responsible for introducing the colorism conversation, is it seems like that's implied. I just have a big problem with that because I can show you literally several examples of articles written before last year's reunion, after last year's reunion, where it is indeed fans and, you know, critics of the show who are also calling this out, okay? 
So it's not like it's just coming from Wendy and Candace, all right? And finally, we will discuss Chris, okay? Because I felt like, you know, Chris had... <laughs> Chris was given the energy that I wanted him to give. At first, I was nervous because I was like, he ain't, gonna, he ain't giving enough. But let me tell you, what he did do, I felt like it, it, he, he, he did. I, 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 was, I was right on the money with him. Now, let me just start here. Giselle's package, you know, her losing her father, we do send her warm wishes and prayers because I can only imagine how traumatic that is. I can only imagine. So, I don't want nobody to have to go through that. So, you know, for me, you know, that to me, I felt like I understood because everybody on that stage was having an emotional response for some reason. And I understand this to a certain degree. You know, people think that Candace cries at the drop of a hat, right? People think that she's overly emotional, whatever the case may be. The fact that she was in that moment, yet again, having a human response to someone saying that they lost their father, and then Giselle's reaction, well, first, Mia is like, well, Candy, because Andy asked, well, can, I'm just noticing, Candace, that you know, you're know you emotional about this. And Mia's like, oh, she cries when the wind blows, echoing the sentiment that Candace cries at the drop of a hat. But then Giselle says, yeah, even when it's not about her. So everybody else in the room is allowed to have a reaction to something that is tragic. And yet and still, you still manage to spit the vitriol about this woman, even though she is having a reaction to something that you went through. You yourself lost a parent. That is horrible. I don't even like I everybody else on that stage was can have that reaction, but it couldn't come from Candace. She could not, for whatever reason, it, it was it was it was now she's making it about her, you know, that she's 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 crying because it's about her. No woman, she was crying for your loss. And you can't even break down your stoic barrier to even let that register within you that someone else could feel empathy for you because you have none. Or so it seems, allegedly. Um, and Candace even says it, I felt for her loss. You know, Andy and, and Mia both then try to show Giselle or explain to her that Candace at least still had, she has some emotion for her. And Giselle is just sitting there like, like she has just seen Medusa and turned to stone. It's very strange to me. And then Andy has to point out, you don't really show emotion that much, do you? No, she doesn't really show much of anything. And to be quite honest with you, to me, that relationship with Jason, it gives me nothing more than the same thing that Sheree and Martell gave me. A bunch of nothing. Okay? Nothing that I believe anyway. Because in my mind, she's like, well, I don't care what somebody does past what they do uh, past my own eyeball, eyeballs. Girl, I mean, if the man was photographed or video kissing up on some other woman, you saw these with your eyebrow, with your eyeballs. OK, your eyeballs had synced it. OK, because I'm sure somebody sent it to you. So it, it, it did cross your eyeballs. OK, your eyeballs didn't see it. Now, I believe firmly well, with 100 percent certainty that Giselle is getting it. She getting it in out there. OK, I believe it. I believe she's just not going to show it on this show. Because of things that have happened in the past, okay? Period. And I would rather her just say that, be honest about it, because ain't nobody believing this relationship with her and this and this and this summer house person. N Raise your hand if you believe it, okay? Raise them. Raise them. Name them. Name them. Name them. Okay? Because I don't. It makes no sense to me. Even at that. I, I, and I, just to go back, you know, 
Ashley then echoes that she was bawling, crying, you know, watching, you know, this, you know, uh, uh, Giselle and her daughters and, and the packages and, and Giselle is nodding like, yeah, so it's perfectly fine for Ashley to have, you know, an emotional response, but that that evil Candace cannot. Okay, I was like, "Girl, get out of here." Um, this is the other thing that I really wanted to go into for me. Robin, it's it's a couple of things real quick. Robin to me does not belong on this show, and it was actually reinforced to me last night when. Candace broke down the timeline of the reasons why Robin was really upset and well, Robin admitted it, okay? So all throughout the season, we were led to believe that Robin was upset with Candace because Candace went on and called her a, a fraud, which they showed, I think, a thousand times. Um, shout out to House of Aaron, baby. They, I, getting getting that, that promo, baby. I love it. Um because that's my boy. But also, too, because Candace had went on to be critical of Robin requiring everyone else to share, okay, and her herself not also considering herself in, the, in that statement, right? So Robin led us to believe it was because Candace was coming for her. But no, lo and behold, the actual issue was that when when Robin said when 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 Candace talked about you know uh, Giselle's white adjacent self and Giselle's actions as a result of that privilege, Robin took that on because she herself, I guess, views herself similarly, aesthetically, right? So as Candace is commenting on her hair. Robin responds, "Yeah, it's that white adjacent something or other in the text message in the in the in the DM thread." Candace says, "Are you mad at me? This is played on the show very differently." Okay, then it is. Oh, I'm Candace says, "Oh, I'm sorry about the things that are going on with you and Juan." After Candace asked, are you mad at me? Robin said nothing. Okay. Then when Cand the news came out about Juan, Candace said, I'm so sorry for what you're going through. Robin said nothing. Okay. So by the time Robin then goes into paywall about her business, AWOL paywall, that's when Candace is like, oh, okay. Well, number one, you ignoring me. So uh, clearly you're upset and can't articulate like a grown-up that you are mad at me and what you are mad at me about. Now you are basically charging the girls to pay um, to, to, to hear about what allegedly happened with Juan and this woman and this hotel receipt. Okay? So, yeah. I get it. So even... <laughs> as <laughs> Candace, I, I don't understand even, I, I get it to a certain degree. I, I think that this friendship really, for some reason, meant something to Candace that, and it did not mean the same to, to Robin. And that's all I can think of. Robin then goes into, it's because of the colorism accusations. I have never been, she wasn't talking to you, okay? First off, Robin, she was talking to Giselle. I know you look at Giselle as the head cheerleader, big sister, almighty. Thus, you relate everything directed at her and you take it on for you for, for whatever reason. OK, Candace's argument was about how the privilege was used specifically by Giselle. Now, what you heard was white adjacent and bam, you lumped yourself up in there. OK, great. Cool. And that's fine, too, because in truth, many of the articles that had been out there and fan reactions also included you in that, Robin. So, OK, I can, let's say you take that on. But my problem is that's not the story that we were fed throughout the season. OK, 
the story we were fed was I'm mad at her because she didn't went out there and talked about me after I didn't turn did I, I didn't try to make people pay for this thing on the paywall. I was just trying to make some money on the paywall. Girl, no, you then when even when given an opportunity to be transparent about what your actual issue is, which was more interesting, okay? That could have been a conversation that you guys actually really had. But no, you couldn't even be an adult and say, girl, that bothered me. And so then she is, oh, this is the conversation about colorism. That's so uncomfortable for me. Oh, God. I was like, where are the tears? I don't see not nay the tear. I'm always looking for the tear when somebody get the, you know, I'm I'm in the lip quivering. I'm looking for the tear. I, I don't, don't, don't listen. I am. I is. So to me, I'm like, because, because at every opportunity, when given the, when, when given the moment to stand on a pedestal and say, this is my truth. You never do it until it is too late. All throughout the season, you go through this, this rigmarole about Juan for, for you to finally get to the reunion and simply say, I have decided that I'm just going to thug it out with this man no matter what. Fine. Everybody can relate to that. Okay? Everybody can. The other opportunity for you to tell us during the season what your actual problem was with Candace. You play ring around the rosy and you talk about everything but the thing that you claim is now is now so bothersome to you. So now we got to talk about colorism again. OK, you brought it up. But we can't talk about it, can we? We can't talk about it because um, Karen says and Karen, Lord bless her heart. She is trying her hardest to be. The mediator. Oh my gosh, she is trying to, uh, I, girl. She is. She, she is really. I mean, Karen. God bless you. Um, you know. Oh, oh, oh. Then for Robin. Then it was the it was the cover up accusations of we were trying to set up on uh, Chris to deflect from Juan. And for Candace, she's like, I've grown up talking about race in in my household, so we can talk about these things and have these level of discussion. And it's not a thing. She mistakenly thought that they could have that conversation. And Giselle pipes in that, well, I went to an HBCU. I'm a sorority girl. And this, that, and the third. Girl, that doesn't absolve you from, from, from uh, colorism. I'm not calling her a colorist either. No, I'm not. What I'm saying is there's an audience perception of colorism that is inherent within the goings on on this cast. That is not to say you specifically are a colorist. That is to say that there is a benefit, it seen, a perceived benefit to those who are of a lighter complexion such that their actions are never seemingly, they're never really seemingly held to the fire. And that may not necessarily come from just within the cast, although the perception by the viewers is that the girls come on the show and they feel like they have to look to Giselle to be big sister almighty until she deigns them not fit for her kingdom and she says or does whatever in order to um, sort of put them into question in some way, shape, or form. Then when they defend themselves, they are then labeled all these types of things. That is the perception. And then the perception that is continuously perceived is that speaking of which, something she says can be taken as gospel, okay? And then she can say it and then just, oh, I'll apologize for that. And then repeat it again this season by saying Chris allegedly forced her into the room and then say, oh, I said the wrong thing. And it's just done when those types of accusations are big. They, that's a huge accusation. It really is. That's this is where words matter. So anyway, 
I'm like, and and the fact that she's like, well, I'm in, I was, I I went to an HBCU. I I've 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 done the sorority. I'm a I'm a sorority girl. And it's like, yeah, have you not seen School Days? I don't think maybe she missed. I'm, I think maybe she missed School Days. Do you, do you, have you seen School Days? You seen you seen have you you you, you seen the good and bad hair, uh, song and dance. What what like you know it, it's just it that to me is an example of how some of this works, and just the fact that she will remain willfully ignorant to what people are perceiving is mind boggling to me, because if you all tell me that I am constantly offending a certain group of people then I have to then say, you know, what am I saying or doing that is constantly offending this group of people who I don't mean to offend? I got to ask myself that. Similarly, how Wendy, as Karen was saying, there's no better group to have this discussion than us. And Wendy's like, incorrect. Okay. The range is not here, ma'am. The range is not here to have that level of discourse because they're not, no one is even willing to look at why I might be perceived as this, or why might there be this perception, and how do how can we move forward from it in a positive, productive way? Okay. And Wendy further breaks it down so that Andy can get it and says it would be like calling. The, the the racist person not knowing, okay, not even accepting that, okay, there could be potentially a reason why someone is calling you that. And, and at least being able to look at, well, why am I being received that way? If you can't have that conversation, then none of all of this is pointless, which goes into what she was saying about the lack of range. The last thing that I want to talk about is... <laughs> And then Ineka, Lord, I, girl, it it I it is clearly your first day at this at this high school, because she was like, well, I don't understand the colorism thing, girl, for real. I'm gonna leave. I'm a. You know what, Ineka? What I'm gonna do for you right now is I'm gonna share a couple of headlines with you um, for you to go through, okay? Now, this first one comes from The Essence, okay? Um, it says it's not just shade, it's colorism, a deep dive into colorism on the Real Housewives franchise, okay? Let's, let's go into it, and they specifically go into Potomac. Let's talk about it, all right? Should do you need more? I got it. Okay, I got you, babe. I got you, babe. I got you, babe. Okay, blavity. All right, yes, colorism does exist on the Real Housewives of Potomac. All for you, babes. Got you, babes. Hold on, babes. There's more, babes. There's more. There's more, babes. Let me give it to you. Okay. Black Twitter accuses Real Housewives of Potomac's Giselle Bryan Robin Dixon of colorism after Wendy Acefo was referred to as aggressive. Baller alert. They're pointing out what the fans are saying. Okay. What more would you like, babes? I've got another one for you. Just lined up here for you, babes, for you to take a gander at. Okay. Distractifies. Time to discuss the Royal Housewives of Potomac's colorism claims. Dive into them, babes. Dive in. And Neca, I've got some homework for you. And the last thing that I want to kind of really get into is just Chris. You know, for me, Robin questioning Chris when Juan ain't even there. Girl, you should not even be allowed to talk to him. You shouldn't because you said you regretted even defending him. So don't be asking him. And if I was Candace, I would have been like, don't be asking my man no questions that I can't ask yours. Stop it. Don't even talk to my man because I don't want no accusations out there. Don't talk to him. Keep your mouth closed. Keep your mouth closed to my married man. 
Okay. And the fact that I think that Chris just basically was like these these little accusations that they trying to throw out there about this other girl. I'm not even I'm not even here for that because you don't chase no lies. Keep it pushing. The fact that he even showed up. OK, it, it was it, I mean, it's 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 it, it's enough for me. The fact that he shows up to sit and have to sit across from a woman who accused him of forcing her into a room. And I love that he called it out. You know, Giselle feel Giselle and Robin feel this way. OK, the woman claims that Giselle had nothing to do with her coming out and making accusations against Chris. Well, Candace feels like Giselle possibly could have because she doesn't trust anything that Giselle says or does. That is how Candace feels. Well, for Chris, those feelings are valid. Just like, you know, Giselle, when you felt uncomfortable, she's allowed to feel how she feels. And the last thing that I want to say is when we talk about range, okay, we talk about range and the lack thereof when in terms of having conversations about serious topics. I love that Chris pointed out the hypocrisy of the lack of range, which is, I mean, it's typically what it boils down to. And Andy exhibited that a little bit last night. Not a little bit, a lot, actually. And maybe he was pressed for time. I don't really know. But Chris made it a great point to say, listen, because Andy was like, I thought you guys were over this issue. And Chris is like, well, you know, it's very interesting that a person can then come back this year and say, basically, that he forced me into a room. But Candace needs to watch her words. And this person who says that a man forced her into a room, which sounds predatory, is able to then just simply say, oh, I said the wrong thing. That's interesting. Andy's like, well, you know what? Juan's not here. What do you guys think about that? I was like, Andy, y'all just going to skate by with this? But that goes back to what I was saying earlier. The reason why Giselle can sit there and say and do what she does is mostly because she knows there will be absolutely zero consequences except for maybe a second seat. Now, with that being said, um, please do not mistake my criticisms of Giselle to mean that I think that she is in real life a bad person. I am talking about what she provides on the show. If, now if you think that's who she is in person, then that's what you think. I'm simply pointing out to you in my mind, the hypocrisy of it all and the lack of range there that lies therein. Now, there's plenty more to discuss that I really didn't get into that I'm saving for my conversation with Kim Pyre, the Kim Pyre. OK, so make sure you guys are tuned in, tapped in to Kim Pyre at 230 because we got so much that I didn't even get into. All right. But I just had to just I had to rant with y'all for like and I, this was unorganized. OK, I had to rant with y'all for a second because these are the, some of the things that really kind of like stuck with me. And I can't wait to talk to Kim Pyre and see what his thoughts are about this at 1030. So be sure to tune in and tap in on Kim Pyre's channel at 230 p.m. Also, guys, be sure to get the new book. Pre-order it. Wickest, the Wickedest Wives. A Vicious Reality, book two, pre-order is available now on Amazon.com, and uh, it will also be available on Audible as well for you guys to consume as well. So with that being said, I will see you guys at 2.30 p.m. on the Kempire's YouTube channel.